But there was a day before the high-speed precision instrument, a day of crude wooden box cameras. Fortunately for us, it was also a day when a small group of pioneers with imagination foresaw the possibilities of that magic eye. Matthew Brady, a young New York State farm boy, was chief among those enthusiasts in the newly born art. In addition to his own work, Brady collected the prints of others, building a pictorial record of our American past. The nation's capital in an era of unpaved dirt streets and horse-drawn vehicles. Replacing that earlier White House destroyed in the War of 1812 was the handsome new home of our presidents. When we speak of those past presidents, their faces are familiar. John Quincy Adams. Martin Van Buren. Andrew Jackson. Their faces were made familiar through the work of Matthew Brady. Preserved for us, too, are those early writers, pride of our growing national culture, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Edgar Allan Poe. Washington Irving. The beloved poet, Walt Whitman. And what schoolboy doesn't know the faces of our statesmen, Henry Clay. John Calhoun, Daniel Webster, men who shaped and guided our young republic. They built well, but soon within the country's capital, still awaiting the completion of the now familiar dome, the storm clouds of the slavery issue threatened national unity. As the crisis sharpened, Brady saw a new use for the camera. Abraham Lincoln, whom Brady had photographed as a young congressman from Illinois, now sat in Washington as president of the divided nation. From him, Brady received permission to make a record of the war that could not be held back. We are coming, Father Abraham. So sang the volunteer units responding to Lincoln's call to arms. Hastily constructed camps sprang up, crude and comfortless by today's standards. The growing manpower had to be supplied and equipped, furnished with the weapons needed to fight this country's bloodiest war. Means to move those masses of supplies and equipment were organized and assembled. This was a day before the phrase motor pool had been coined. Old Dobbin was the hay powered engine that turned the wheels of war. The now middle-aged Brady and his assistants recorded all. What is it, wagons, was the name the soldiers gave to the mysterious horse-drawn photo labs that Brady sent into the field. The clumsy contraptions were to become a familiar sight wherever men were mustered and trained. Training then meant the inevitable close order drill, but also long forgotten formations, such as the hollow square defense against cavalry attack. The cigarette had not yet been invented, but the civilian turned soldier took 10 and welcomed that brief break from duty. Preparation has its own grim ends. The conflict flared into full flame, and presently the capital itself had to fling up hasty defenses against sudden and determined attack. War, now in full violence, was being carried 
to our inland waters as well as on the high seas. The nation's shipyards were turning out newer, more effective gunboats. For the first time, naval warfare saw revolutionary new ships sheathed in armor. The expanding navy had ceased to be the property of the New England states with their deeply rooted seafaring traditions. Men and more men were needed, and they came from inland cities and the western plains. Mechanic and farmer proved they too could develop sea legs and man a 40-pounder. Mere boys were enlisted too, youngsters who could run powder to the waiting gun crew. The awakening sciences of the century found uses on the battlefield. The Telegraph Corps, from which emerged today's Signal Corps, brought new speed into communications. So highly technical was their work considered that even linesmen were often civilian technicians. Born too was warfare's first venture into the skies, balloon reconnaissance was employed to spot enemy batteries. The balloon was frequently set adrift in the belief that a favorable breeze would carry it back. Sometimes it did. Of civilian origin was the publicly endowed United States Sanitary Commission. One day it would evolve into our present American Red Cross. The tragic aspects of all wars, past and future, were soon evident. This was Richmond, Virginia. Charleston. Fredericksburg. War meant to the uprooted, the homeless refugee the prisoner of war doomed to a captivity under subhuman conditions. These were the wounded in an era when the trifling flesh wound would lead to gangrene and amputation. When hospitals were few and far behind the lines. Finally, War meant those who would fight no more. So ended 483,000 Americans, North and South, a total not even reached in World War II. What do we know of the day-to-day -day life of the man who served? Well, like his counterpart today, he lived in countless company streets. Winter quarters were crude log shacks built by himself. He knew fatigue and details, and he killed boredom in his own way, and polished up before endless inspections and reviews. When and where possible, he enjoyed rare visits from family and friends. There was no handy PX, but licensed tradesmen called sutlers set up shop and even followed the troops into the field and on their campaigns. Great grandpa posed for photos to send to his girl back home. Sent his folks a picture of the outfit too. And his own buddies. Like today, there was always one comic, one clown. The serviceman of that far-off day carried his faith into the field. Doubtless he prayed for survival and for the war's end. It came at Appomattox with the collapse of the Confederacy and General Lee's surrender to General Grant. Yes, peace came. But only after battlefields like Gettysburg 
had immortalized in blood the courage of brother ranged against brother. Gettysburg, where a parade and now forgotten ceremonies introduced a never to be forgotten address by the war weary Lincoln. Within two years, the president dedicated to binding the nation's wounds was shot down by the assassin John Wilkes Booth. The camera brings us Ford's theater, the final scene, and the presidential box where the tragedy struck. It brings us to the actress Laura Keene, the last person on whom the unsuspecting president's gaze rested. It has even preserved for us the 21-year-old Dr. Leal, who emerged from the horror-stricken crowd to attend the dying Lincoln. An era had ended, the first, but not the last, to be seen through the magic eye of the camera. The pages of our history, with new pages yet to be added, all our yesterdays are preserved for generations to come. For this achievement, a major share of our gratitude must rest with the man whose foresight made it possible. Earliest of American combat photographers, he lived to within four years of our own century. The pioneer, Matthew Brady.